back. We're live. Welcome to Mad Gains Live. Bienvenidos a otro episodio de Mad Gains in Vivo. Soy su host, Cassandra Gaines. Hoy tenemos un episodio con invitados especiales. Uh, quien nos enseñara, mi español es mi mano, malo. Nos enseñara un poco sobre el transporte de artículos de México a los Estados Unidos. Uh, es, este episodio está en inglés. So this episode is in English. Lo siento. <laughs> My Spanish is really crappy, you guys. Pero les invito a participar con sus comentarios a través de uh, YouTube. Uh, en español, si tú quieres. Uh, en más allá, tú puedes uh, conectar con, 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 con uh, muchas personas acá. Uh, clique el botón de suscribir y live chat, ¿ok? All right, <laughs> that was it. Hablo, hablamos, hablar, hablamos en inglés. Whew, más fácil. Ok, you guys, sorry, that was my broken Spanish. I tried. <laughs> ok, welcome to Mad Games Live. Today we're going to talk about going in and out of Mexico. So welcome everybody. You all should hopefully be on YouTube. I want you all on YouTube. When you get over to YouTube, I want you to click on that live chat button. I want you to also make sure that you are clicking on the subscribe button and make some friends in the comments because that's where everybody's having some good discussions. I've got some very special guests for you today. They're gonna introduce themselves, but I wanna tell you guys something before we start. So the reason why I tried to open uh, in my shit ass Spanish is because I'm trying my hardest to, um, hmm, how do I say it? embrace many different countries, many different cultures, and different languages here in Madtropolis. We are not solely Americans, we are all. So when I launch my educational platform, I'm going to have education for in all languages and for everyone, including our friends in Mexico, uh, whom we love greatly. So I have special guests for you. First is going to be Carlos, because Carlos has been a friend of mine for a long time. If you need help, in Mexico, legal help. He is the number one attorney to go to. He is your person. If you can't find his information, just email me and I'll send it to you right away. I've known him for years. I trust him with my life. Carlos, could you please introduce yourself? Of course, Cassandra. How are you? And hello to everybody from Mexico City. Um, my name is Carlos Sesma and I'm a third generation attorney uh, in a law firm by the name of Sesma Sesma McNeese. Uh, I've been working in the transportation and logistics space for ever that I have any memory uh, since I'm since my father also works in that space and I've, I've been in that basically since I was born so uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of good people a lot of uh, good friends in this space and um, I enjoy it very much we have offices in Mexico City in Querétaro and in Monterrey And uh, we're a full practice firm, but my, my practice area is transportation logistics. And that's how I also know these two fine gentlemen that are with us. And uh, as Cassandra correctly said, uh, I've known her for several years and she's a very good friend of mine. And I'm very happy and excited to be here with her. And who do you have with you? This is Miguel Quintanilla. And it's one of the greatest uh, uh, people that I know in the industry. I actually know him because... Uh, I'm a second generation attorney with his company. My father uh, used to work for his father and uh, now I have the opportunity to work with him and his family. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be sitting here with him and I'll, I'll let him take it, take it over. Well, first of all, Cassandra, thank you very much for the invitation. We're very excited to be in this, in this program. And um, like Carlos said, I'm a third generation in the transportation and trucking companies. Uh, it, this has been a family business. We are um, pleased to be one of the largest Mexican carriers in, in Mexico. We run around 1,300 uh, tractors plus another 500 uh, small trucks. And uh, we are dedicated uh, to the international business. We do Most of our uh, business through Laredo, and also we do 
we 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 handle the whole country. We have twelve offices around the country, so we basically touch the main cities in Mexico. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so you are our go-to person for Mexico. Um, of course, Carlos uh, Carlos knows you. Carlos knew exactly who. So I was like, Carlos, I want to do. I get all these questions about. How do I ship in and out of Mexico? Like for real, Cassandra, 101, I have no idea. And especially um, lately, there's been a lot of shippers who have said that their companies have started operations in Mexico and they have no idea where to even start um, with regards to the transportation. Um, so that's how this all started. And I went to Carlos and I'm like, Carlos, I need your help, man. And then he was like, I know two perfect people and that's you and that's also Rafael. Rafael, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Rafael Tawil. Uh, uh, again, like Miguel said, thanks for having us, Cassandra, on the show. We're really excited to be here. Um, Miguel, who just spoke uh, so eloquently a few minutes ago, is actually my boss. Um, so uh, I actually have a role uh, within TUM, which is I handle all the cross-border uh, business and all the uh, freight that we handle into the United States. We actually have a small presence in the United States. Uh, currently run about 250 tractors out of uh, Laredo, which is where our US corporate office is. Um, and our business model is, is quite particular. Uh, we currently uh, haul what we call door-to-door -door freight between Mexico and the United States, uh, using a combination of both uh, the Mexican division of TUM and the US division of TUM. And it's, it's been very beneficial to our, our customers uh, because it gives them a lot of confidence that it's the same company handling uh, their freight from point A to point B without any third parties in between. So, um, you know, we've been very successful with that model and, uh, you know, we, 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 hope to, we hope to explain a little bit further in a few minutes. I love it. Um, so Carlos already knew what I was looking for. And Carlos, you like scripted out a whole, a whole outline for this show. Where do you think we should begin? today to help everybody understand because you've been you have so many u.s customers shippers carriers and brokers uh, i know a lot of your customers um and uh they love you and um so you know already what we don't know <laughs> so where should we start do you think well i think that a very good uh starting point for this discussion is to give you a little bit of the panorama of what mexico is from an industry perspective so what what can you expect when you're looking at the transportation industry in Mexico, looking for, looking for a partner in order to, uh, to engage in this business in Mexico? And what are the main things that you will be finding from an industry? So uh, I think that uh, the, Miguel can take this, this, uh, this discussion and tell us a little bit of, of how uh, Mexico is structured from, from that perspective. Yes, of course, uh, Mexico as uh, uh, Mexico, most of the Mexican carriers in Mexico are, are owner operators. I think- uh, Ah, just like us. 95%, yes. Okay. I, I actually wondered that. I was wondering if you guys just had like five big carriers or is it just guys and gals in a truck like our country? We have a few large carriers. Yes, we do. But most of the most of the of the trucks that you see, uh, they are owner operators or very small mm -hmm. companies with three to five trucks each one of them. So um, I think the the bad part in Mexico is that the age of the fleet that we have in Mexico it's uh, it's pretty old. So we really? Have, yeah, yeah. You mean like the actual equipment? The actual equipment. Mm -hmm. the actual equipment it's. Uh, most of it is, it's, might have a, an average of uh, 15 years. Oh, wow. So yeah. in the US, we have shippers sometimes that won't even let us come onto their property if we have equipment 10 years or older. That's correct. Mm, that's correct. That's amazing. That so that, that happens to us too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we cannot bring uh, a truck or a trailer that has more than, well, the trucks have to be with our customers no more than six years. And the trailers, they cannot go for more than 10 years. If not, they, they won't load them. They won't allow us to go into, the, in, into their facilities. 
So it's um, the same thing. Yeah. So um, how, what do you have to do to start? Like if I, if I, Cassandra want to start up Cassandra trucking, um, wait, no, Victoria trucking in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> this is by far my favorite beer as I've told everybody in the whole world. Um, if I wanted to start up Victoria beer trucking, uh, yes, it's going to be called Victoria beer trucking. Um, what do I have to do in Mexico? Like, can I just get a freaking license and application and just hop in the truck and go or buy a truck and then go? Not necessarily as easy as that, uh, as it would be, which would be the same in the US and actually in Canada. We're very similar to having one restriction, which is the fact that if you're planning to do uh, domestic transportation, mm -hmm. you're going to have a restriction and you won't be able to start your company as foreign investment, foreign capital, because the domestic transportation or cabotage is limited for the nationals in Mexico, in Canada, in the US. So um, there are, however, other types of business that you can engage in, such as international transportation. You could actually open a company that could engage in international transportation. And, hmm. but that would limit you exclusively to render the international transportation services. You would need to then use Mexican carriers to do the national call, which basically is the same as it would be in the US. We, we have the same situations. Now, there's a, there's a third option, which is possible. And it's also the, the, trying to have an American company obtain permits or a Mexican company obtain permits to go to the other country. So the, there's a possibility that an American carrier, for example, could get a permit to do business within the Mexican territory uh, and register within the Mexican transportation authorities. And it would be the same requirements that a Mexican company would have to register in the US uh, and obtain a US DOT number. Now that is, has been always, it was always sold like the, like the great, uh, moment of NAFTA when, when it started to come. And we were all <laughs> expecting to see when this was going to actually take place. And then when it actually took place, nobody signed up. So we have very few companies that have the, capabil the capability of doing this type of service. Because of course, there's, a, there's, there's some risk adverse situations that, that you want to, that most companies try to avoid. It's difficult for a it's difficult for a, a, a Mexican company properly to, to engage in having its own equipment and operators cross the border. And it's the same for a, an American company to do that. So actually the model of having partner companies across the, uh, the, the border is generally what everybody it makes tries sense. To. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but if you are just a company, if, if I live in Mexico and I just want to drive truck just in Mexico, just driving around just in Mexico delivering beer. Do I just file for a permit? Like what, what exact, what are the exact steps? Or can yes. I just get the truck and deliver? Well, you, well, you need to get a truck, you need to have an operator and you need to get a permit to operate. So okay. it only going to be doing locally or federally, but you need to get a permit. Carlos, I have spent a lot of time in Central America, a lot, because um, I love it. So th this is the difference between Central America and America, okay? <laughs> um, there are many things, but I can tell you one of my favorite things about Central America, because I'm a lawyer and I love breaking the law and rules, um, <laughs> litigators be like, is that there's the law, and there are the rules, and then there's the, you can just do whatever you want. Um, for example, red lights and stop signs and anything else. Uh, you can just do whatever you want in Central America, I feel like. So can I just do whatever I want, Carlos? Let's, can we just be real for one minute? Can I just get in that truck and just drive? <laughs> do I really, like, what's the chance I'm gonna get pulled over? And if I do get pulled over, can I just give him 20 bucks and keep going? I see Carlos is sweating it, right? He's like, oh, Jesus, Cassandra. You didn't say you're gonna ask these questions. God, but let's, let's, I just, I'm so curious. Just tell me the truth. Waiver, waiver, waiver. No, the- uh... <laughs> <laughs> Everybody watching Mad Games needs to sign a waiver right now. <laughs> oh yeah, that, by the way, since we do have two lawyers on the show, I do usually say, we are not your lawyers, people. We are not your lawyers. You need to go hire a lawyer. We are here to guide and to educate, but every single situation has different facts and different laws applicable. So anything Carlos and I say today, we are not your lawyers. And I am a litigator. I love 
litigating, and so does Carlos. So if you even try to sue us, beware. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> go ahead, Carlos. <laughs> Here we go. So can you do it? You can try. Now, the situation is that it's very easy for, for an authority to, to, to look at this and, and, and stop you because you're not going to have the plates. You need to have the transportation plates. So can I buy them from someone, Carlos? I am a New Yorker, so we like to buy things. Yeah, we're... probably you could. Now, still. Or you can steal them. Or you can yes. Steal them that's, that's a lot cheaper. They do, I'm that's... sorry, you guys. Okay, so for those of you who are putting their noses up at us right now, they do that in the US all the time. Um, where they switch the license plates on trailers and trucks. So U.S. citizens, don't be thinking you're so cute. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting, but I love this topic. I've, so I've been driving around Central America and my husband actually got really mad at me because when we go on vacation, we just rent a car and go, we go. Um, so anywhere, everywhere. And I like to take videos and pictures of trucks because I have no life. And uh, I often wonder like, are those stickers real? Are they really yours? Or are they plopping on the other truck? Look at Carlos. Carlos was like, oh shit, I'm never coming on the show again. There's, there's always going to be something like that going on. But okay. uh, cool. there's one thing that you also can consider. And it's the fact that if you're not registered as a carrier before the Mexican DOT, and this is a good one, you don't have access to the limit of liability that the federal law allows carriers to have in Mexico for cargo damage or loss. Ooh. So if you're not registered, you're basically liable for 100% of the cargo. If you're registered, you're liable for an approximation of $60 per ton of cargo. So... Can you tell me what ton is? Ton? What, how a, many pounds? A thousand kilos. A, Pounds, Rafael. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos. It's all right. I'll let you guys. Or somebody, can you somebody put in the comments like how many pounds are in a ton? Because we have forty four thousand pounds. We probably have forty thousand pounds of cargo on our trucks. So we're thinking, how many? How many did you say? Six dollars. Oh, to know. Hold on. Uh, by the way, Miguel. Uh, people already in the comments, for some reason, they're saying they love you. Oh, thank you. I love yeah, them too. Yeah, you're already, you already have fans. Uh, uh, Carlos, I'm sorry, they're not saying they love you yet. I think it's because you're a lawyer. It, that happens a lot, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Ra Rafael, do you have anything to say? I'm going to completely derail Carlos's schedule and organization and to this uh, show. Rafael, when are you? Were you laughing at me when I was asking if you can just steal the plates or if I can just get in that dry, truck and drive with a bunch of cash and just pay anybody off that, I can, that pulls me over? Because that's what they do in the movies, Rafael. I mean, I've even lived it in the states, right? I mean, so I don't think <laughs> yeah. it's here to Mexico. Uh, you know, where we, where where I live, Laredo, a ton of trucks, ton of truck movement, and there's actually. Uh, a border patrol checkpoint uh, about 15 miles out of the border. Um, and so you see this type of thing all the time where uh, a truck will actually, uh, you know, copy someone's decals um, and try to cross the border with, you know, narcotics or illegal aliens or anything of that nature and then try to just frame it on somebody else. Right. So, yeah. That that happens all the time. Good thinking, people. Uh, okay, so someone said, of course, Madtropolis is all over this. They say uh, many people have said it's about 2,000 pounds. So, Carlos, you said how many dollars per ton? 60, 6 0. 6 0. So, 60 dollars per ton. Okay, for, let's say you have 40,000 pounds divided by 2,000 pounds. That's 20 by 6. So, for a full truckload, you get $120? Kind Did of. I do that right, Madtropolis? Crap. So, you, so what he's saying, you guys, is that I think, Carlos, right, if you are driving around in Mexico and you, God forbid, get in an accident or damage all the cargo, cargo in that entire trailer, I think you only get $120, people. So, oh, my God, Amanda Miller is laughing at me. Um, so that's $60 per ton, right, Carlos? Right, unless you contract something different. That's what the law says, but this can 
contract it out. Okay? You can opt out of this limit of liability and it's very important that you consider that because it's very different from what you would be used to in the US. And, uh, and you will see that given that situation, a lot of uh, Mexican carriers will try to shy away from having a contract because it's under benefit not having a contract. They'll, they'll go with the limits of the law and, and all of the provisions of the federal law. So what you want to try to do is when you're looking for a carrier, and, and we can go a little bit more into depth on this, but when you're looking for a carrier, you want to have a contract and you want to be able to establish your conditions in a, in a very... Uh, well-standing contract and one of those will be liability and your expectations on liability no you guys are wrong hold on one minute i'm sorry carlos oh shit okay okay hold on hold on i did my math wrong okay so you guys uh, i'm a lawyer i went to law school not math school assholes all right you get twelve hundred dollars okay so that whole truck rolls you get twelve hundred dollars like carlos said unless you contract otherwise carlos is there insurance for that cargo available Yes, there is insurance available, but it's too expensive. And most of the <laughs> most expensive. of the most of the shippers, they don't like to pay for it. So uh, I think uh, the thing in Mexico is that our competitors, that uh, most of them are owner operators, and being realistic, none of them have uh, sometimes insurance, not even for their own truck. So. Uh, what we face is that the customers, uh, some of them, they, they like to get cheaper rates. And when you talk to them about a, an insurance, they don't like to pay for it. Yeah, that, we that, have the like same Carlos, problem, Miguel, in the US. It's annoying as hell. Yeah, so <laughs> like Carlos said, I, I think the most important part is that the customers will have the contracts with the carriers where they could specify what, uh, what will happen if, if the carrier has an accident. Because also a big problem that we have in Mexico is security, thefts. So, so um, <clears throat> like, is it more than here in the US? Because we have a big problem too. And for any of those who think, Cassandra, what are you talking about? Uh, you got to start watching more of my shows because we have a big problem here in the US with freight. But our, our freight gets stolen when it's left in lot yards like left over the weekend, sitting in an unsecure yard, somebody pops a lock, they're ch not even the lock, right? They're, they're popping the, there's no freaking lock probably. They're looking inside and then they're like, oh, look at this, a whole bunch of Victoria beer. <laughs> so what happens in, the, in Mexico with that? Well, first in Mexico is not only, it, it happens on the highways. We have several risk uh, regions in the country where there is violence to get a truck, to hijack somebody. So it's, it's different than the, than the States. Our, yeah, yeah. Our violence is, is, is uh, probably the numbers are, could be similar from a percentage perspective, something like that, but our type of violence changes. Uh, here, what you have is violence over the road and we do get uh, we, we need to be very careful, even selecting the routes when we need to, yes. they change the risk levels, no? Yeah, you have to select the routes and also there is times to be on the route. So if, let's say, uh, for us going through Puebla after 5 p.m., we have to stop in our yard and sleep there. We won't allow a truck to go on that highway during the nighttime. Wow. Yeah. And you sleep with the truck. That, that, Wait, some other part are you, okay, can I, can I tell you guys something? Uh, in the U.S., truckers like to have guns. Are you guys allowed to have guns? No. No. Allowed. So you sleep and you risk your life. Well. Sleeping with that cargo? Do you sleep in the cab like we do? Yeah, they, they sleep in the cab, but they, we have secure yards where. Ah, okay. You have like a guard. Yes. A, a, yes we okay. do. Okay. Yeah, but most of the carriers, mm -hmm. they can stop in, in, um, in truck stops, in gas stations, where they, they can be more secure, too. 
Okay, so when trucks let okay, uh, uh, this is a really good question from one of my favorite people, Steve Prez. He's uh, runs a cool dispatching company. Uh, hey, by the way, anybody have questions? Which I can see a lot of them are popping up. Um, make sure to find Amanda Miller. She is my favorite flatbed broker out of Alabama. She always has my back. She, you know, she usually texts me, messages me the questions that you guys have. Um, but one question has come through: Is do let's see, do trucks move in caravans to improve security? Like, do you have do you hire security to come with you? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes they, they they drive in caravans, and they also have a uh, armor police following them. Wow. You know, secure the trucks. Yes. Um, depends on the loads for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, for me, if I was like moving medical equipment or something like what, like what is the most popular commodity to steal here in the U S it's like food and beverage off the hook. They love to steal that. Cause you can sell it quick on the black market. Um, any electronics is really hot. Um, uh, baby food, uh, anything you can sell quick. Uh, what is the, like, is it, um, uh, cigarettes. Cigarettes. cigarettes, yeah, for us too. Cigarettes are good shit right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Booze as well. Uh, don't smoke kids. But yep, mm -hmm. alcohol, cigarettes. Electronics. Cigarettes are electronics, yep, same for us. So for those, uh, and Roxanne just said clothing. Uh, good, good point, Roxanne. That's popular here in the U.S. Uh, to steal. Um, uh, okay, so so to pause on this, Raphael, we're gonna we're gonna bring you into this conversation. Um, you can't, you can't, you got to work for your beer, Raphael. Um, first of all, are you drinking? Um, I'm at a lake house right now and I, yeah, I, had, nice, uh, I had a little too many of those last night. So I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, it's good for you. I had fun last night. Not so much fun in the morning. <laughs> um, okay. So what are you telling Americans when they're like, Hey, uh, Raphael, I don't want my stuff. Like this is a very important shipment. I want it there on time. I, I don't want it stolen. I don't want any problems. I don't want any breakdowns. What do I need to do? Don't say I have to hire you, Raphael. You have to pretend like you don't work for, for um, what Americans would say, Tom. You have to pretend it's Tom, right? It's Tom, yes. Okay, because you know us Americans, we're gonna be like, that's Tom. Um, <laughs> so it's true. <laughs> So uh, it's fine. You know what? You guys are a bunch of assholes on YouTube. You can make fun of my Ivy League education. I see it right now. I see you. Um, so Raphael, uh, how, like, what do you tell us? Like, if I'm like, I am going to hire one. I can't afford your amazing company. How do I look for another company? And I know this goes against everything that you want to tell me right now. But do it anyhow. I know your boss is breathing down your neck right now. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh man that, that's a that's a tough question so i mean i'd probably just do my best to do my due diligence and find a reputable carrier um mexico seems to be from my experience uh a lot of the the, the solid carriers tend to be more regional um mm -hmm. and depending on uh the zone in which you're going to be uh loading out of um try to find the best carriers in that area in that particular area how do i know who the best are do you have like a do you have like a, a a review board, like a like a something I can Google that has reviews on it? Like how do I know? Or am I shooting in the dark? Really? To be honest, I I think that's where I'm laughing right now. <laughs> I, I think a lot of uh, the the cross border uh, shipping industry is very old fashioned, um, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity in that sense to find a better method to identify. Uh, solid Mexican carriers. And so I think the market is, is trending in that direction, but, uh, but it's really a relationship based uh, a system at this point. So a lot of the U S carriers that do business in Mexico um, will have a, uh, you know, a representative that's in charge of the relationships with potential Mexican carriers. And so there's a lot of uh, visits. There's a lot of going out, having dinner, you know, really meeting them. Uh, going out and visiting visiting their facilities and figuring out what uh, you know what type of trucks they purchase, what type of standards they have. Oh wow! For yeah, you do need to do your research. Dang. Yeah, a lot of that stuff. So um, I, I, it is re really old fashioned at the same time, but uh, but it's worked up to this point. And and uh, and Miguel has a lot of experience uh, in dealing with a lot of the larger U.S. carriers and has really good relationships um, in that way too. 
Carlos, the most common question that I get, which I don't, I never know the answer to, that's why we have you, um, is how do I vet a Mexican carrier? That's, that's a very good question. Let me tell you first off that uh, in Mexico, we don't have any, any of the online resources that you're used to having in the US. Okay. There's a very incipient uh, uh, registration in, that's online for the Mexican DOT, but the information there is not necessarily updated as it should. And uh, it's not really something that could give you certainty as to authority even of the carriers that you're looking for uh, in Mexico. I, I have to totally agree with Rafael that we need to be uh, a lot more, uh, we need to do a lot more research in depth here. Because for example, to actually make sure, I mean, we get, say we get the uh, file from one Mexican carrier. And generally what we will do from a, from a goodwill perspective uh, is we're gonna look at, they, they're showing us authority, they're showing us their insurance, they're showing us uh, the, the, all of the documentation pertaining to their compliance. And generally we will bet and say, okay, and you know, we have certain, certain uh, uh, requirements that we need to check uh, on the box. But really, if we have one concern, one minor concern, we need to go actually to the hard file in the Mexican DOT and get the Hard paper. as in manual? Yeah. Paper? We, need to look, we look at the file. We, 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 we actually vet the, the authority at the Mexican DOT office. We get the, the, the paper file and we verify this actually is a registered carrier and that they're pre pre presenting their proper authority. And you cannot only stop at proper authority and, and, and DOT compliance. You need to actually go a little bit further. You need to actually do the site visits, as Rafael said. You need to verify the status of the vehicles and actually that they actually you know, have the vehicles that they say they have. And you, know to, you, you need to also make sure that this is a company that is incorporated, that it's in good standing. So it's, it's a lot more that you need to do for, for vetting in Mexico. You won't have, for example, accident boards uh, where you could, you know, look at accident records uh, in, in Mexico. So it's going to be really hard for you to find the history of accidents of a specific carrier. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, you really need to go, you know, one step further. And as Rafael says, there's, there's efforts in the market and uh, of, of getting this type of certifications in place by third parties. And uh, we think that in the short term, there's gonna be uh, offerings, but at this point, you really need to do it rough. And, and it's very important that you actually do it. Okay, so my, I'm gonna pause you right there because we're then at some point in time, don't let me forget Carlos, we have to dive into the accident world, the liability, all that jazz. But I can, I know that there are, I have a heavy following for people who are in compliance where they vet carriers, et cetera. I know they're having heart attacks right now because they were hoping Carlos would say, go to this website and dip -a -dip -a -da 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 and request an insurance certificate <laughs> and -da 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 -da. And now they're hearing not basically nothing. Like, like, uh, so, so what do, what do we do Carlos or Miguel or Rafael? I, I, I've got a, I've got something I, I forgot to mention. Uh, oh, good. There's, there are, they're not perfect, but there are certifications in place that Mexican carriers can have. So, for example, there's one called CTPAT uh, certification that's issued by uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Mm, good Protection. point. So, that's a good one. Uh, so, so there you're using, uh, you know, the Homeland Security as a vetting uh, mechanism to determine whether or not the carrier is safe. Uh, I mentioned it wasn't perfect because I think it's been a while since... Uh, U.S. Customs authorities have actually gone and done the on-site visits in Mexico, um, so it's it, you know it's not you know a, a perfect way of determining whether or not they're they're a very safe carrier. But the fact that they're enrolled in the program, um, you know, says a lot. And, and so there's yeah. there's CPAT, there's a new certification in Mexico, I think called OEA, as well that's been implemented as well. And then there's also uh, you know ISO, uh, which also is, exists in the U.S. Uh, as, as a method of determining whether or not they they they, they run their operations uh, um, in 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 a in a, in a in a in a good fashion. So 
I think those are some some mechanisms are there in place, but it's definitely not not perfect. But then we have to know: Am I really hiring the company that has this entity? Yeah, Carlos knows what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. uh, I think that would be something I would be worried about too. I'd be like, oh no, um, I don't know if I'd, I'd know what to do with that. Uh, you will find Cassandra in locations that figures have several companies. That's true. And they're going to have one that's CTPAD compliant and that they have everything in place, but they present a contract with another company within the yeah. same group. And then that's that company all the time in the US doesn't too. authority, doesn't, you know, that, that's, that's where you need to, to be very aware. There's always, there's always the possibility of having uh, somebody that actually knows the market. As, as Rafael was saying, you need to have an individual that, that, that's going to help you with the carrier selection in the market, somebody that's, that's well-versed uh, within the, the Mexican market. And a lot of this is managed again through relations. So these individuals have to have experience. They have to, they have, to have a, a little bit of knowledge in the market so they can put you together with, with good carriers, no? Yeah, and we have very good carriers in Mexico. I have excellent competitors. I mean, it's, we have uh, good companies and uh, secure companies uh, with low incidents and uh, in accidents. So um, I think also going through Canacar, that's the Mexican Chamber of Transportation, they could give you also a list of uh, carriers that are good all around the country. So. Canacar? Yeah, Canacar. That's the Mexican Chamber of Transportation. Okay. Um, all right. So for those of you who, who feel like their heads are spinning a little bit, because I see some comments on here like, oh boy, this is the wild, wild west. Da, da, da. It is kind of in the U.S. too. It sounds like we got to take Carlos's advice and we just got to find people who are local. They know uh, they're trusted. We got to go back old fashioned ways of finding our friends. You guys have resources right here on this show that you can reach out to and, um, and, and using them as resources because this isn't something that we can succeed via internet because you guys do, is, are you guys have load boards or anything like that in Mexico or are you using all US? Yeah, I think it's important for those comments that we say two things probably and, that, and I'm pretty sure uh, Rafael and Miguel will agree with me on this. Um, we are a different country altogether and we have a different language and a different government and actually a different legal system that mm -hmm. what you guys are used to having in the US and, and uh, that you use for your business. So of course there's gonna be challenges and things are gonna be different because we are totally a different story. But that doesn't mean that there's no, not a sophisticated business office of offering here and that the companies that are rendering service here um, even down to certain owner operators, they're not going to be sophisticated in their offerings. We do have load boards. Uh, the companies that are uh, mid to top generally have uh, a very important technology offering um, that, that's you know, top notch. And you would be surprised that certain technology offerings of Mexican carriers would compete very importantly with uh, offerings in the US. So um, there is, of course, uh, a, a business to be made here. There's a lot of money to be made here, but you just need to know your ways, your ins and outs. And that's probably the, the situation, right? Yep, I agree. Um, so uh, for those of you, oh, by the way, I was just notified that LinkedIn has not been working. This is why <laughs> I push all of you to YouTube because LinkedIn is still in beta form and I have a beta account with LinkedIn but it's very spotty and I keep trying to warn people about that. So those of you who are just joining us, I see you piling in on LinkedIn. Amanda Miller has put in the comments, the link to go on over to YouTube and make sure to hit the live chat button and the, oh, the I can't even speak English now, the <laughs> subscribe button and um, join us because what we're talking about today with experts, we have Carlos, we have Miguel, we have Rafael and we're talking about moving freight in and out of Mexico, which is a world that not many of us truly know and understand. Big key takeaways is it sounds like, Miguel, it sounds like from you, um, there are a lot of complexities similar to the US with regards to running a trucking company. Um, 
uh, you have owner operators um, and you have to deal with expensive equipment like we do. Um, and do you have regulations around safety? Um, and do you have to worry about accidents and do you have insurance and all that jazz that we worry about when we run trucking companies here? Yes, we do. We have to have them because um, um, we have a very good platform of clients that they uh, will ask us to have all that. Yes, yeah. so we have insurance. We have uh, all our trucks are owned by us, trailers too. Uh, we have uh, security devices in all the in all the in all the trucks and trailers. So we have GPS in all of them. I was going to ask you about that with track and trace because we're all obsessed with track and trace in the U.S. Uh, especially some sometimes. No offense to my shippers who are out there, but sometimes yeah, I'll get obsessed with track and trace. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask Miguel about that too. Like they're like, hey, you know, where's my freight? Uh, uh, and you know, so you use GPS. I'm sure you call the drivers too. Do you have dispatchers? Yes, we do. We have dispatchers. We have GPS. Uh, we follow. We have an area that it's the GPS works with the dispatchers, and we have a security area where we work only for to be taking care of the security of the loads. So we have we use it for both things, and right now. With the new technology that we are getting on the new trucks, we get uh, also information regarding the, the truck and the driving, how the driver is doing and, and, and all of that. So we work a lot on, uh, with our insurance company in order for us to reduce as much as possible the accidents with our drivers. So yeah, yeah, we do the same like in the States. Dear, dear drivers, I already see this coming up on YouTube. You guys are ridiculous. You, <laughs> you drivers have hours that certain amount of hours they're allowed to drive and certain amount of hours are not allowed to drive. Yes, like they laws, do. Yes, not danger. There, there, is, there is a law, but um, nobody, I, the, the big companies, we have to. But yeah, you have to. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other carriers or the small companies, they actually don't, Pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, before we had the electronic monitoring. All right, I'm not going to make friends when I say this in the U.S. But before we, Raphael's not smiling. Before we had electronic monitoring, I think there were a lot of people out there not really following hours of service laws. The big guys had to, but the other guys were like, eh. and why? Why does Cassandra know this? Because when ELDs became a thing. Y'all flipped out and didn't know how to use the hours of operate hours of service regs. They were all like, how does this work? Holy crap. Uh, but the big guys had to do it too. So same for us, Miguel. Uh, sorry, it's just, that's, yeah, that's I, kind I, of a too, tough thing. Rafael can, can tell you about that too in, in the company that we have in the States. No, we take- Yeah, it was, a, it was a shock. It, was a, it, it caused shock waves at, at our company uh, to say the least, um, you know, it limited our productivity. We all of a sudden we saw the same rules applied, but for some reason limited our productivity because now we had to follow the rules exactly how they, they, they were designed. Mm -hmm. But and they're the not designed time, very well, are they, Raphael? Like they're annoying. I mean, they, well, they seem to be changing, uh, which is- uh, Kinda, it feels like a Band-Aid, doesn't it? Yeah, like, yeah it does. Here you it go, does. here your little 30 minutes and da, da, da. Yeah. nah, man, we haul that shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, and, I, and I agree completely. Um, but one thing it did help us out in doing is that we had a department at the company whose sole job was to was to audit the actual paper logs, and so there was a lot of mm -hmm. there was a lot of falsifications. There was a lot mm -hmm. of moving moving things here and there, and so I had to have mm -hmm. two or three experts. Just literally, their only job was to find out whether or not the driver driver yeah. was lying. That's actually very good trucking right there to have those people. Um, and they existed in, so anybody who's surprised by what he's saying, don't be every truck, every solid, like larger trucking company. They all have these, these experts at auditing, don't they, Raphael, where they're like going through line by line and they know, they know everything. They're quick at it. Yeah. Well, we're, we're not a very, we're not a very large carrier, but at the same time we were, we, 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 we found out through growing pains, right? All of a sudden we were like, Hey, this driver drove 5,000 miles and in five days it's like that's impossible right and so uh, we got a, we got a couple of tickets here and there and so it kind of forces you to have to 
pay close attention to that compliance part. And then yeah. I think the U.S. does a very good job of, you know, once you compare it to the way Mexico does things, uh, of measuring the actual safety metrics uh, with the CSA, for example, uh, measuring the unsafe driving and the driver fitness and the hours of service regulations. And so um, we're actually, you actually can get an alert um, on the DOT system. And we've actually gotten an alert before and we've actually gotten visits from DOT saying, hey, you, got, you, need, to, you need to clean this up um, or you can get in some trouble, right? And so, um, be, you know, learning through that process has been extremely important. Now we have yep. safety consultants and, and all that stuff. And I think it's extremely important to pay very close attention uh, to that because it's also a cost savings at the end of the day. You, you limit your- and I, and I think every carrier has to go through it too. Yeah. In order to learn, I, for some reason, you can't learn this stuff from a book. In order to learn how to do it, you have to go through that pain process you just, you just discussed. Sure, it's sure, very sure. interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, okay, ready for another? That's fine. You guys can all make fun of me. I see you on YouTube. You all can make fun of me. But when I ask this question, it's fine. Um, why is Laredo so popular to, to move freight in and out? Or is it the only... Okay, d real dumb question. Is it the only place to move freight in and out of Mexico? No. Or are there other hot points? Brown, brown. So, so, so there's there's several points. Um, but Laredo currently has the last numbers I saw was roughly between forty and fifty percent of the market share of all the freight that crosses from Mexico to the United States, and that's a huge number. Um, and so, I mean, I think part of it is it's it's a very good geographic uh, point to cross the the freight through because it hits the I-35 corridor where you get to Dallas and Dallas is a very important distribution point where you can hit other, uh, you know, uh, parts of the country. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, Laredo has the infrastructure as well, um, has the commercial bridges in order to cross on time. And, the, you know, if you ever visit Laredo, uh, it just seems like everywhere you turn, there's a new warehouse popping up uh, where freight can mm -hmm. be stored. And so, um, and a lot of uh, the larger carriers in the country I think if you really looked at, um, uh, you know, their their infrastructure, you would be you wouldn't be surprised to see that um, probably behind their corporate office, one of their second or third largest terminals in their network would probably be their Laredo office. Um, everybody has a huge terminal down there, um, but it's also a good thing and a bad thing, right? Because, you know, what I've learned in the past few years in trucking is that it's very cyclical. Um, you had 2018, which was a really solid year for all trucking companies. Everyone was extremely profitable. And then Laredo specifically, 2019, uh, we just saw, you know, a flood of trucks uh, hit the market and it really, um, you know, strained uh, rates, freight rates heading out of Laredo. Um, you get to 2020, COVID happens, um, rates decrease even further. And then right now, it seems like there's a capacity constraint. And so now rates are starting to go back up. And I hope that's the, the norm going forward. How are rates in Mexico, Miko? Well, after COVID, <laughs> uh, the rates are not good. The rates went, went More down. More crafty there. Yeah. And uh, also, when you want to compete with owner operators, our infrastructure is a lot more expensive. So our, yep. rate, our rates are a lot higher than the yep, than same for us. most of the customers are used to pay. So we have to work a lot with our customers and, and try to look for savings in the company in order for us to be, to be profitable, you know? because the rates are not, are not as good as, as we think. What about now? Are they better? Are they higher now or are they still crappy? <clears throat> right now? Mm. Oh, they're still crappy. <laughs> Don't get they're still They'll crappy. get better. Huh? Here you go. Lots of people are going to reach out to you for business anyhow because they know that you're legit. So uh, they will get better. But that's interesting. I think uh, we suffered the same thing during COVID. We had a, we had a real, real low period <laughs> for rates. And then the carriers are all complaining, complaining, blaming brokers, blaming shippers. It was a mess. And then now the carries are quiet because the rates are very high and there's capacity constraints. Um, um, and I think I think I think Raphael seen that Raphael seen that in in Laredo too. Raphael, do you guys have operations in Brownsville? We don't. We don't currently. But um, you know that that area of Texas is actually very strong in uh, refrigerated transportation, and so 
that's something that in the future we we could definitely look into. Yeah, uh, I think. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and, and and sorry, another very important point regarding because we were talking about rates and uh, mm -hmm. and the Laredo market is very. Uh, uh, the market is for transportation is always northbound and southbound. Um, and so south right now, northbound rates seem to be getting higher. Southbound rates are still pretty bad. Um, and there's a lot of other external factors that go into that. The devaluation of the peso has a lot to do with how much Mexico can import uh, U.S. product. Um, and also the saturation of trucks in Laredo doesn't help because everyone's looking for that same southbound uh, freight and there's not the volume there to sustain it. So um, that's the biggest challenge in Laredo currently is that northbound pays well, southbound doesn't pay very well. Hmm. And I'm sure it's the same in, in Mexico. Yeah, I was trying to think. I'm wondering, real, another stupid moment, fine. I'm just gonna watch you two. Um, <laughs> another stupid moment. I'm wondering if it's because people the highest rates are around outbound California. There's a couple hot spots in the U.S. where rates are really high. So carriers don't want to go too far from there because then they're missing out on freight. I wonder if they go south into Mexico, they're missing out on, on opportunities. So they don't want to go south. Uh, no. I, I, okay, I'm going to stop thinking out loud now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go back to my Victoria. Uh, okay, Carlos, we have, we have six minutes left. Um, uh, before I ask you this big question, I do want to tell everybody, you'll notice that a key key point has not been discussed during this episode, which is customs and more of the cross-border uh, interactions. Carlos and I thought maybe this was, it was, it was a bigger conversation. So we're going to bring Carlos back. He's going to help me design another show. I think, I think we decided it's October 23rd. Correct. And, um, and uh, we're going to have a customs broker and we're going to talk about all that jazz. Uh, so just in case you guys are like, what the hell, Cassandra, you missed the biggest gap. It's because we, we need a full hour for that kind of thing. Here, it's more understanding Miguel's world, more understanding Rafael's world. And for Carlos to tell us, uh, okay, so two questions for you, Carlos. One is, could you please explain liability for Americans when you're transporting freight in and around Mexico? And then two, um, is there insurance that shippers can purchase to cover their cargo um, in Mexico, and do you have insurance brokers that you would recommend? Those are the two questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with the first one because that's that's faster. Yes, there is. Uh, there's insurance that you can purchase in Mexico for sure. Uh, and the remember that when you're purchasing insurance, you need to go either to an international broker or to a Mexican insurance company. Insurance companies can only uh, cover risk within their uh, jurisdiction, so you would need to look for a Mexican insurance company or an international broker that have business in Mexico as well uh, across the country. Um, the availability of insurance for shippers is there. Uh, it generally in Mexico, as Miguel was saying before, shipper insurers, uh, that's, that's generally what you will find because of the, uh, the, the, the restraints that, that Miguel was telling us about the costs of uh, insurance from a, from a perspective of a carrier. Uh, carriers don't really carry generally, not all of them, basically more, most of them don't carry cargo insurance because of the cost that it implies and because they have the limitation of liability. Um, going to liability, I'll let me get, uh, tell you about the brokers that he recommends, but the, um, but the liabilities uh, that you need to be concerned about when you're working in Mexico is that the limitation of liability is available only for registered carriers before the Mexican DOT. Okay, so either Mexican carriers registered before the Mexican DOT, or as I was telling you a little before, an American company that gets a permit to enter into Mexico that's registered under the Mexican DOT also receives that benefit of the limit of liability, uh, which is very rare again. No, so, uh, but but, 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 but the, the carrier receives the benefit, yes. not the shipper. That's the shipper. That's no bueno because they only get twelve hundred dollars for the freight, Correct. which I'm sure they're not going to be happy about. <laughs> yeah. So just and wanted to make sure because we have all three groups watching, I just wanted to make sure my shippers understood that uh, that's why you have to pay attention to whatever Carlos is going to say about insurance because if the, if done right, right, Carlos and the contract doesn't say anything different. Um, the liability is capped at twelve hundred dollars per truckload. Yeah, but even even though there is a limitation of li liability, if um, if uh, if the 
if the customer has its own insurance and they get paid for that accident, the insurance company will then sue the Mexican carrier to get that money back. And then right. we stand in defense. Yeah. No worries. Then, then, that's why Carlos is with me. That's why <laughs> Carlos, you guys know Carlos. <laughs> No, the, the, because either it's precisely for that third layer that we have, which is the intermediaries. Any, the intermediaries have, have a dual uh, situation in Mexico that need to consider. First, the intermediary space is not, reg, is not regulated in Mexico. As such, for you to, to become a broker in Mexico or a 3PL or any sort of intermediary for land transportation, you really do not need to have any registration, any insurance, anything. You just open up your company and you start doing your business. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can also do it from the U.S. by hiring Mexican carriers. You don't really need to have the company registered in Mexico because there's no permits mm. issued for intermediaries at this point. Um, now, but that also puts you in a position that you're not regulated. And if you're not regulated, you don't have a limit of liability, my friends. So the situation is as an intermediary towards your shippers, you have 100% liability if you do not contract out. So again, we are coming to the point that contracts are very critical in doing your business in Mexico to manage liability, either towards your transportation companies or towards your shippers. Uh, when you're an intermediary, it's very important. Otherwise, you're like uh, stuck in the middle of a sandwich in a very complex place. Very complex. Um, tell us about the liability. How many minutes do we have? Oh. Well, you could sum it up for us and tell us about the liability that we should know about moving our freight, especially for shippers and brokers. I guess and carriers, all three, if you can. If, we, if you think it's gonna be a big conversation, we can save it till October too. We should save some space for October, but, okay. uh, and, I, and I think probably the wrapping up on this, and I'll of course think that uh, Rafael and Miguel uh, should give us their insight here. I think that the, the, the most important thing that we need to consider in closing up is that there's a lot of business to be made here. Uh, and by coming to Mexico and taking the actual step of coming to Mexico, not everybody actually takes the, the step and the risk. Um, and if you do it measured, mitigated, calculated, you can do a very good business. And you have the, posit the, the, the benefit that your competitors not necessarily will always take that step. So there's good business to be made. There's uh, good partners to have. You just need to uh, follow the, the local in and outs and uh, make sure that uh, you have good relations and good partners to, uh, to engage in your business. No? Yeah, I agree with Carlos. I, I, think, uh, I think the business between Mexico and USA, every, every time is faster and it's more secure. But when you do it, you have to make sure that you do it with the right people in Mexico. And there are some excellent US carriers that do the door-to-door -door service into Mexico, in and out of Mexico, uh, as well Mexican carriers that they do the same in the States. So um, it's just that you get close to those carriers or brokers and you're gonna be fine. When there's a lot to do in Mexico. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, it sounds like, you know, we're lucky to have you guys too. Rafael, do you have some key takeaways for us? And, and, uh, and I think at some point in time, we should, we should do a little bit more about uh, your world in an episode as well. Um, Cause we didn't touch on your world as much as I wanted to, but that always happens. Sure, yeah. I mean, just echoing what Carlos said, I think it's extremely uh, you know, true. Um, there seems to be a huge uh, boom in manufacturing in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that product ends up in the U.S. And so by nature, there's a ton of freight to be moved between both countries. Uh, but it's really just understanding the complexity of, of cross-border shipping and, and, and finding the right partners to do business with. Um, if you do it the right way, there's definitely a lot of money to be made. Um, and it's definitely a business that's going to grow in the future. I think so, too. I really do. I think that we should expand on these episodes. We should, um, we should provide more education and resources around this so that we can both countries can expand this area and it's not so unknown and scary, uh, this unknown, scary world. So uh, thank you guys very, very much. You guys are amazing partners. Um, Carlos, thank you. 
And uh, to all of those who are wondering how they reach out to Miguel, how do they reach out to Rafael? How do they hire to Carlos? Um, I'm going to put their contact information in uh, the YouTube comments. Um, you can also find their links to their LinkedIn pages in any of my social media posts. Uh, you can also just email me and my assistant will send out um, their contact information as well. Sounds like these are our people to move right in and out of Mexico. And thank you guys very much. And I would just like to let everybody know I only drank one Victoria. I planned on drinking like four. I only drank <laughs> one. <laughs> so I guess I got to drink more this afternoon. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, you guys. <laughs>